And now, tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tonight, we bring you a story more amazing than any fiction that dramatized court reports concerning a man who tried to clear himself of murder, a factual document we call Once a Murderer. So now, starring Ben Wright, here is tonight's suspense play, Once a Murderer. Him for. I told you, he said he'd lease the place and to give him the keys. How was I to know? Well, doesn't look like he's moved in yet, anyhow. Thought she said he'd be here. Ah, open. Well, that's help. We can get our stuff out before he snigs them. Uh, I'll take the ladder. All right. The uh, tools and box are in the corner. You going to the races tonight? Well, I don't know, mate. You? Oh, not me. I'll lose another farthing on those ruddy dogs and the old lady will bash me head in. Oh, well, that looks like the lot. Sure you didn't leave anything else? No. All right. Hello? What? Behind the counter. Looks like a shoe. Half a tick. Oh, love it. Duck! Cool. It's murder, Tom. That's what? It's a murder! Look, Tom. I oh, know. Uh, look, 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 you stay here uh, and I'll call the police. Oh, crikey. Oh, crikey. Look at her poor face. Oh, it's, it, it's horrible. Uh, yeah, yeah, Bert, Bert. You all right? Bert. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I think I'm going to be... No, you wait outside. You, you'll feel better in the air and I'll, I'll, I'll get a copper. I won't be long. Bert Shin and I worked for a firm of signboard fixers. Bert was my foreman, and as I told Peggy later that night, I was surprised the way he turned soft all of a sudden. Funny what the look of a dead body can do to a chap. Well, I suppose it takes all kinds, though. Like the inspector at the police station asking me questions about finding the body. Uh, funny way he had. Then looked. Fat. Sloppy. A cigarette, Mr. Shaw? Yes, I don't mind. Thanks. Uh, here. <sighs> Thanks. Yeah. Now, I'm sure you can help us, Mr. Shaw. Just answer these few questions, if you will. You are 31 years of age. That's right. Born in England. Yes. And you are a permanent resident of this city. Yes. Now, sir. You and Mr. Birchin discovered the body of the young woman, Anna Leeming, this morning in an empty shop at number 75 Bond Road. That's right. You uh, went to the shop in order to gather a ladder and some tools which you, Mr. Shaw, left yesterday. Right. Mr. Shin was not present yesterday. He was not. Ah. Now, um, at what time did you leave the shop yesterday? But all, oh, oh, must have been about half past um, five. Mm. You had removed a uh, two let sign on the premises. Oh, I had, yes. Will you tell me why you left the ladder and tools after you'd finished? Yeah, oh, well, I didn't have the car, and it was late, and the wife and I had a date. Ah, yes, I see. Uh, did you see the deceased at any time yesterday? No, no, not yesterday or any other time. Ah. Mr. Shin, in his evidence, testified that you had given the shop keys to an unidentified man. Will you tell me about that, please? Oh, well, it's the same thing I told Bert. Uh, this bloke come along and said he had leased a place. Did I know where the keys were? Oh, this bloke, uh, how was he dressed? Oh, he uh, pretty sporty. Plus fours. Brown, I think. Hmm. Can you describe him? A uh, medium height. On the uh, <clears throat> fat side, if you know what I mean. I uh, know what you mean. Go on. Well, that's all. He gave no name? No. Nope. Oh, would you mind using that ashtray, Mr. Shaw? Oh, oh, sorry. Thank you so much. But um, you gave this man a set of keys which had been entrusted to you by the owner. Oh, that's right. He said he'd leased it. I took his word. I, so I'd just taken the sign down on order, oh, so... Oh, of course, you thought that uh, he had every right. Uh, what then? Well, and, uh, time was getting on, so I thought I'd leave and come back today for the tools. Did the stranger stay in the shop after you'd gone? 
Yes, he said he wanted to look round. He told me not to worry about my things. He'd lock up when he left. Ah. Then didn't you wonder at the time how you'd managed to get in this morning if the door was going to be locked and you no longer had a key? No, he, he said he'd be there early. He said he'd let me in. Oh. Uh, what did you say was the colour of the man's trousers? Plus fours. Brown. Oh, yes, of course. How silly of me to forget. And you'd never seen Anna Leeming before? Never. Ah. Well, you have been most helpful, Mr. Shaw. We may wish to get in touch with you again, particularly if, uh, when we find the man who leased the shop. Identification, you know. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. anything I can do to help, Inspector, you, uh, you just call on me, eh? That's most kind of you. Good afternoon. I thought that would be the end to it, but it wasn't. The owner of the shop said he hadn't leased the place at all. He decided to take it over for himself. Well, that left me with my story, the man in plus fours, and no way to prove it. Well, they gave Peg and me a hard time. Police, newspaper reporters, neighbours, everybody. It kept on like that for over a month, and then one day I... I got a call from the police to go down to the station. Oh, it's so good of you to come, Mr Shaw. We've, uh... <clears throat> found a man who seems to answer the description you gave. Well, it's about time that things have been pretty nasty, you know. I lost my job. I've got a wife and kid to think about. Well, then your identification of this man will clear up any doubts concerning you, won't they, Mr. Shaw? Has he confessed? Unfortunately, no. He denies everything. Well, I expect you won't have much trouble after I identify him, will you? No, I expect not. Uh, bring in the suspect, please. Mind if I smoke? Oh, no, not at all. Sure, match. No, I've got one, thanks. Oh. Ah. All right, Mr. Shaw. I want you to have a good look at this man and tell me if you've ever seen him before. Hello. Well, don't say hello to me. I've never seen you before in my uh, life. That will do, Mr. Cottle. <coughs> well, is, uh, is this the man? Yes. You're absolutely certain? I think so. Clothes look about the same. Uh, would you ask him to say something again? Uh, Mr. Cottle? I already will say something, I will. You haven't got any right to warn me in here. Like as what oh, I was... That, 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 that's enough. You're not on trial. Well, I, I've got my right, I have. Not fair. I think so, Inspector. That's the way he sounded when he asked for the keys. Mm. You'd be willing to swear to it on oath? Yes, I... I think so. Yes, that's the man, all right. But he wasn't. He'd been out of town during the week the girl was killed, and he proved it. So it was an unsolved murder. Then that's the way it stayed for two years. Oh, the papers forgot about me, the dead girl. You now, people who read the papers forget, but the police don't. And whenever I went looking for a job, there was always somebody who remembered the name Thomas Shaw. That you, Tommy? Yes. Any luck? No. Oh, Part-time work, there's not enough in it to keep a fly alive. Oh, as a kid. Asleep. You've been drinking? Oh, the couple of beers at the corner. Mm. Well, come on. Dinner's been on for an hour. Uh, fish? No, filet mignon with caviar. What do you think? Oh, no, look, there's no need to get funny. It's not my fortune, though. I suppose so. Oh, Tommy, what are we going to do? Ever since that, that girl... Oh, Tom. Oh, no, love, I oh, know. That old cat next door was talking to the postman I heard her... She said it was a wonder they let a murderer walk about loose. Oh, she did, did she? Well, the next time you see her, you give her a smack in the eye for me. Or perhaps I'll do it for myself. Oh, what's the use? Well, now, come on, kid. Things will get better. You'll see, ducks. I couldn't get better, though, not until I did something about it. I made up my mind what to do a week later. I had to make it right, and there was only one way. I'd made arrangements for the wife and kids, so I knew they'd be all right, and then I called a police inspector. Chief Inspector Osborne here. Hello, Inspector. This is Tom Shaw. Remember me? Two years ago? Oh, 
I remember, Mr. Shaw. Well, I just called because I want to make a confession. A confession? Uh, Mr. Shaw, where are you? Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to run away or do myself in. Uh, what is it you, uh, you wish to confess, Mr. Shaw? I want to confess the murder of Anna Leeming. Listening to Once a Murderer, tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. This week, an annual hunt for unknown and unknowing diabetics is underway. Diabetes can be controlled. People live completely useful lives with this disease. But it is important to discover its presence to avoid the possible serious consequences of neglect. This week, hundreds of communities are providing free tests to determine the presence of diabetes. Test yourself or be tested. It's simple, painless, and sure. And now we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage, Ben Wright, starring in tonight's production, Once a Murderer, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. That was in July, my confession. They didn't bring me to trial until September. You'd think that a man who'd made a confession would make it easy for him to get it over with. Well, it was raining cats and dogs the day they brought me up to the dock in criminal court. The judge was a nasty old devil, Sir William File, and he looked it. <coughs> Clark, read the charge. Members of the jury, the prisoner at the bar, Thomas Shaw is charged with the murder of Anna Leeming. And it is oh, your that charge jury, silly-looking bunch. I'd been on juries, I knew what they were like. Somebody or other always grumbling, wanting to go home to baby or back to work. Call a man guilty so as they can be home in time to go to the movies. I know, I did it myself once. Of course, it wasn't a murder trial. by my learned friend, Mr. Shakespeare. Proceed with your case, Mr. Beckett. Mr. Shaw, I have here a detailed statement describing how you inveigled the young woman into the shop that evening two years ago, strangled her, and then made off with the money in her purse. Will you show the evidence to the prisoner, Mr. Beckett, so that he may see it for himself? Certainly, my lord. I call to your attention, Mr. Shaw, an excerpt from your confession. Here. Yes? Would you be good enough to read it? Aloud, please. <coughs> You're all right. Um, I I lost my temper and put my hands around her throat. She seemed to faint away and fell back out of my hands on the floor. She didn't scream or speak. I knew that something was seriously wrong when she fell back and lost control of myself and cannot remember exactly what happened afterwards. Uh, yes, thank you. Well, that'll be enough, I think. And uh, that is your confession, Mr. Shaw. No, I wrote it, yes. Now, that will be all. No more questions, my lord. Any questions, Mr. Shakespeare? If you please, my lord. Mr. Shaw, will you tell us the story you first told the police concerning the men in plus fours to whom you gave the keys of the shop? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, this fellow in, in, in plus fours come up and, and he said he'd lease the shop and to give him the keys. You had never seen him before? No, but I took his word. You then left the premises, and this man within the confines of the shop. That's right. Did you see the girl, Anna Leeming, at all that night? No. Did you know her personally, or had you ever seen her? No. I put it to you plainly. Did you kill that girl? I did not. Why did you make that untrue statement, the confession? Because I hadn't got a chance to prove I was innocent. I wanted the whole thing cleared up properly. I wanted to be arrested and put on trial so I could be proved innocent by law. Then people let me and my wife and kid alone. A peculiar way of proving your innocence to say that you are guilty of murder, sir? 
It was the only way, my lord. That will be all. Not by a long shot, it wasn't. Mr. Edward Beckett was at my throat for another hour. He made me dizzy with his questions. But when he was done, the judge leaned across and looked over his specs at him. Mr. Beckett, do you think it possible to convict from the evidence? I do not think so, my lord. Quite so. <laughs> Members of the jury, I've indicated to you through this trial the matters to which you should apply your mind. There is no evidence against the prisoner except for his own statement. It's quite obvious that he's a liar, but you can't find a man guilty of murder simply because he's a liar. I therefore direct you to find a verdict of not guilty. Things were a little better after that. I got a job or two, the usual... That kept enough in the earth for the kid, Peg, then a pint now and again for me. I was fed up. Men like me want money. Lots of money. What's the use of grubbing about all your life trying to save sixpence here, sixpence there? Now, I had to get hold of something worthwhile. I found it when I met Harriet Vaughan. But she was a widow who owned a flat near the motor works. Middle-aged, but still pretty good-looking. We took to each other like a couple of lovebirds. Of course, I had to keep it dark from Peg, but that wasn't hard. I'd done it before. Uh, what time is it? About 11. <coughs> yeah, especially for you. Oh. Not too weak, not too strong. Oh, thanks. <sighs> oh. Now I've got to go. Too many late nights for me. Peg's going to start wondering what kind of job I'm doing. You're not going. Oh, now you're not going again. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Oh, by the way, could you spare a five? You see, there's a dog running to mind. No. No. I'm sick and tired of this. For the past month, it's been the same thing. Spend a couple of hours here and off you go. I'm not giving you any more money either. Oh, come on now. I've told you, Peg. I don't believe you. It's probably another woman. Another woman? What do you take me for? Look, it's just a fiver tonight, and I promise tomorrow night... I haven't night... got any money in the house. Well, I've, I've got to have it, sweetheart. It's an emergency. You don't think I like asking you, do you? No more. All right, well, make it two quid. No. You're going to get nasty. No more money. Oh, I'm onto your game. It's not me. It's me money, that's all. Well... You've seen the last of both of us. All right, all right. But for old time's sake, a few quid, a farewell present, eh? Present? You? Oh, don't make me laugh. I'll have to take it myself, then. Don't you dare. I'll, I'll have no more on you. Keep away from my bag. Now, you take it easy, Auntie. There's no need to get all excited. You give that to me. You clear out of here. Now. Shut your mouth. Oh. I'll, I'll have the law on you, I will. Yes, you do. You tell him what a naughty boy I've been. You tell him all about yourself, too, eh? That'll look nice in the papers. I don't care. You you can't make a fool of me. I'm calling the police. You come back here. Take your hand off of me. Police! I don't want to hurt you, but I'm going to have to unless you... No, I warned you, now it's your own fault. spread all over the papers next day. Nobody seemed to know anything about it. The murder hadn't left a clue. Police suspected a robbery motive, but that's as far as they were going. But I was pretty lucky myself. I took the five pounds, tripled them at the dog races. I thought I'd give the kid and Peg a present, so I, I bought a train for him and a new dress for her. Oh, it was a treat to see the tears in her eyes when I gave it to her. Pure silk. Oh, oh Tommy. Ah, now, nah, go on, take it easy. Go on and try it on. I'm going to set up the kid's train. It'll be all ready when he wakes up in the morning. Eh? Tom, I... Go on, put it on, eh? <laughs> Oi, you know something? I always wanted a set like this. Huh. I think I'll have as much fun as a kid working it. 
Of course, it's only clockwork, but it's a starter. Oh, you wait till you see the engine. Peg? Hey, what's all this? Why, you haven't put it on. Don't you like it? Listen, if the colour's no good, you can change it. There's no reason to cry ducks. Come on, now try it on, see if the size is right. I like the colour, I thought you would. Hey. Don't you touch me, don't. What's the matter? What did I do? Where did you get the money for those things? What do you mean, where did I get the money? Where? Tell me. Or shall I tell you? Ah, now you're upset. I'll tell you what. I know about you. That woman who was murdered. You put on the dress and we'll go out. I know you've been seeing someone. And I followed you to her flat last night. I saw you go in. She was dead after that. That's where you got the money, isn't it? You told anyone? No. You wouldn't lie to me, would you, Peg? I haven't, I haven't. Not because of you, but the kid. You did it, didn't you? Well, didn't you? Now you listen to me. You don't know anything about anything, understand that? You didn't see anything, did you? I'm afraid of you. That's two you've killed. You kill me next. Don't be silly. I should have told the police. I'll be next. Or the kid. Now, what I did or what I didn't do is none of your business. You attend to your housework. I'll take care of it. Well, I'm going out for a while and... Don't you talk to anybody about anything, mind? Don't you forget what I say. Not a word. There was nothing else to do. Peg was right. There was a kid and there was her. I didn't want to hurt her and I knew that sooner or later she'd say something. She had to. But a man's got to protect his family, so... I went to the police... I confess to the murder of Harriet Vaughan. It was the same court, the same judge. And I had another shock when I saw the prosecutor. I knew him and I could tell by the way he smiled that he knew me. It was Beckett, the same one who'd been down my throat last time. Ooh, he wasn't supposed to say anything about the other trial, but he had a funny smile as he came up to me. Mr. Shaw, odd coincidence meeting you again. Uh, now, you stated in your confession that you murdered Mrs. Vaughan because you did not have the uh, uh, fortitude to take your own life. As far as I can remember, that's what I said, yes. And that by committing murder, you would, in that act, forfeit your life, thereby accomplishing your aim of suicide. Yes. Uh, would you mind explaining to us your reason for contemplating the taking of your own life? I said I'd quarreled with her. She was finished with me. I knew I couldn't go on living without her. And I didn't have the nerve to kill myself. Will the prisoner speak up? I'm sorry. I said I, I didn't have the nerve to kill myself. And that is what you stated in your confession? Yes. Uh, no yes. more questions, my lord. Mr. Lyons. Thank you, my lord. Now, Mr. Shaw, you have admitted to the writing of the confession. I have. Is it true? Oh, but one thing. I did have a quarrel with her, but I didn't kill her. Explain to the court, if you will. Yeah. I went back to the house to apologize, and when I got there, another man was just coming out of her flat. I went in, and I found her lying dead. And you knew then that the police suspicions would be upon you because there was no proof of the other man being there? That's right. I put it to you, Mr. Shaw. Did you kill that woman? No, I did not. Why, then, did you confess to the police? Oh, because they wouldn't have believed me, and, and, and I wanted to have myself cleared by trial. Thank you. No further questions, my lord. Cross-examination, my lord. I understand, Mr. Shaw, that you repudiate your confession. Is that so? That's right. It, it's all true about the quarrel, but I didn't kill her. Yet, Mr. Shaw, you've painted an excellent picture of her death in your confession... Every detail, I might add. I didn't kill her. If you wanted to confess to a murder you had not committed, what could have been more convincing at the time than to put your head out of the window and call the police? Well, well I... I hadn't exactly decided to confess to killing her then. However, your description of the murder is graphic to the extreme. 
how do you account for that? Oh, well, I would... You know, I, I, I could tell by looking at it what had happened. It, 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 it was just good... Good guesswork, that's all. Were your fingerprints guesswork? On the glass of whiskey, on the knob of the door, on her handbag? Did you know, Mr. Shaw, that following your confession, your wife came to us of her own volition and substantiated your movements on the night in question? No. I didn't know. No. I didn't think that you did. I'm satisfied, my lord. No further questions. Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. Do you find the prisoner, Thomas Shaw, guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty, my lord. I didn't really think it would work, but there hadn't been any harm in trying. It's a funny thing about a sure bet. If it works once, don't try it twice. Oh, well. Thomas Shaw... The sentence is the sentence laid down by law. I haven't been a good father or husband, I suppose. It is that you How many of us are? This place to a lawful prison. But what I get from Best these memoirs is for Peg and a kid. Hang by the neck until the only thing is, dead. I'm sorry I can't be around to spend some of it. Suspense, in which Ben Wright starred in tonight's presentation of Once a Murderer. Be sure to listen next week to radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Anthony Ellis, who also wrote tonight's script. The music was composed by Lucian Marwick and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Featured in the cast were Betty Harford, Paula Winslow, Richard Peel, Joseph Kearns, Charlie Lung, Ramsey Hill, John Dodsworth, Herb Butterfield, and Byron Kane. Know the way to follow the best of the music when you dance? Well, you'll follow the dramatic highlights on CBS Radio's Monday through Friday daytime drama, The Guiding Light, just as closely. Listen to the inspiring stories of people like yourselves, your friends, your neighbors, tomorrow and every weekday on most of these stations. Listen while you work. Dr. Malone is here on the CBS Radio Network.